I think we just start up. Um, uh, as I mentioned to you, to you at the very beginning, uh, one of the challenges in international trade in general and international transport uh, more specifically is that uh, the rules might just apply to parts of the world and you, you should make uh, be aware of that, uh, all that fact. But now for the good news, so to say, these rules uh, which we are going to talk about now, the INCO terms, uh, they prevail in most throughout most of the world, and um, well, uh, just <laughs> to give you one example, I have a good friend that used to use for Norwegian company or uh, actually American company FMC, which is big in uh, offshore business and it's a pretty global company. He stayed in uh, five years in Saudi Arabia, and on some quite a few occasions he, he took these incoterms rules and said, "This is my Bible." And all those, of course, the people uh, in Saudi Arabia being mostly Muslims who say, oh, your Bible? They got pretty curious about that. So, uh, well, what they actually meant that uh, these are rules that are very important in my, my daily life. And um, I'm going to talk about what Incoterms is and is not, because there are quite a few in the understand uh, misunderstandings here. You have also the logic behind Incoterms. Uh, this is extremely important to understand because you should be aware of the fact that in real life uh, many incoterm situations occur and well it can be quite a stress, much stress around uh, uh, as related to risk, costs uh, and goods being stranded somewhere and then you sort of being able to sort out what are the real issues are extremely important. You also got this brochure here, on, I suppose, for your fellow students in in uh, in uh, Oversun. We should save some extra. Uh, has everybody got that brochure? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm uh, sorry to say it's in Norwegian only, but I try to explain what are the main uh, the ingredients here. Okay. So, what is Incoterms about? I Meaning also what it's not about. You choose a term of delivery and it's an obligation related to time and place of delivery uh, and also well to the transport risk. So, you should ask yourself when are the goods delivered? Where are they delivered? And how? Meaning the conditions of the goods. Are they the goods I order? Or are they, um, are they um, not the uh, quality I order? The quality you have to de define in a contract? Or um, have there been some... Uh, uh, part of it destroyed in the way. Those are the basic questions. And as I mentioned, to your risks, it's also if you can foresee things, that's really not transport risk as such. At least the transport insurance company wouldn't uh, accept that. Um, hmm, I just, uh, just wonder if now. Okay, we go to the Incoterms party, so, um, sorry, um, well the Incoterms parties, they are always the seller and buyer according to the sale contract. That might, as a point of departure, seem pretty self-evident, but you speaking of globalization should be very much aware of the thing that Incoterms is always Mind you, always related to the physical uh, transport of goods. I just give you one example that uh, underlines the importance of, of knowing what you're dealing with. We can take two <coughs> different colors just to to um, underline. Okay, I am an exporter located here in Molde. I am the seller. I'm located in Molda, okay? You have the buyer from a contractual point of view. They are located in China. In... Sh 
Sheng Du. But the goods who are actually produced, they are produced in Prague in the Czech Republic. And they are not sent to China at all. They are sent to Almaty in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia. The parties, according to Inco terms, are the seller and buyer, because, oh sorry, uh, because they are the ones signing the contract and it's a sales contract or if you're on the side of the buyer the buyer's contract that is important but these goods have never been and they will never be in Molde the transport starts here in Prague and that is the point of departure if you sell on XRX FCA term and so forth, we come back to that logic uh, in a little while. That would be in Prague. And if you if they have a door-to-door -door transport, with me as a seller having the risk all the way, and the, the, the delivery as to how, when, and why, it's actually here at the destination, sellers at not the seller's place. Here you have this DDP conditions. So, you might think this is uh, fairly easy, but I can tell you in real life, the people mix up this. And if you say X works FCA in Molde, it's nonsense because you have to relate to the physical transport and the goods start moving. And uh, also, to give another example, uh, if they haven't started moving, um, you have in many um, countries now um, rules uh, related to um, um, pallets, tree pallets, uh, and these should be heat treated, and uh, you have a sign on them because um, you have some uh, animals that could very well uh, take their um, um, well, to, to, to wish so say, to stay on with the pallets. And if you bring these animals to well, from one continent to another, they can cause huge damages. I've seen pictures of uh, or forest in J Japan being uh, totally ruined by such animals. Uh, so, so it's not just uh, bureaucrats who invented uh, a rule, but it's from an uh, environmental point of view. And uh, in this case, you have the Norwegian export companies, they didn't produce the goods itself, they were actually produced in Hamburg and um, the buyer also in this case was in China and um, the, this machinery that was in question here was produced, it was put on pallets, it was strapped because as you know the seller had to secure the goods properly, that's uh, part, part of, of their obligation and uh, then somebody found out, hey, what about these pallets? They are not properly uh, heat treated, there's no sign on them. And knowing that when they came to China, that would cause a lot of trouble because the Chinese authorities wouldn't allow it. They had to sort of unstrap them, they put it on other pallets, and you know, the, the consequences related to time and costs would be, could be great. You cannot, if you have a door to door promise uh, as a seller, you cannot fulfill your com obligations or it would be extremely expensive. So you had to unstrap this uh, machinery, you put them on other pallets that were uh, according to international rules. So is this an Incoterms question? Yes or no? Anybody want to answer? You have 50% chance of being right. <laughs> yes or no? Any brave people here? Come on. Had this had this consignment started to move? Or this happened actually inside the German factory? 
Accordingly, it was no incoterms issue. I mean, this just to line up, you have this basic seller abide according to the sale contract, the goods having to be transported. Uh, and this, as I said, you can, in many cases, uh, uh, this uh, incoterms questions come up in a stressful situation, so you should know what you're, you're talking about. As I said, transport risk, that is an issue. Here you have some containers on the west eastern side of England. Because if this were you with a seller, you with a buyer, who is at risk? Quite an important question. Uh, some of these uh, containers actually contain uh, no Norwegian goods. I could even mention a company, but of course, from reasons of discretions, I won't. But it could be a real issue. And uh, well, what we are in the holders associations uh, occupied about that all transport companies whose equipment is not well, not quite up to date to be uh, diplomatic. And uh, if you have a time promise, then that could be uh, quite uh, challenges. And also, you have the transport costs. And now I'll. Um, you all uh, have written down this or uh, or memorized it somehow. Okay. What do you often see in the real world? You have an inland transport. You have a main transport and uh, the last transport leg. And what is quite typical is that you have this. Um, you have the cost here, just put it simple in kroners. You have the distance here in kilometers. Okay, the first transport leg often can be quite expensive actually because the amount of goods may not be consolidated, so related to the, the number of kilometers might be quite expensive. But then you have the the main transport leg, uh, let's say from Rotterdam to Shanghai, from uh, or the other way around, from uh, or from New York to uh, Antwerp, you have um, big consignments. You have many uh, companies competing to just get that transport, so they are tend to be relatively low. Then again, you have the last transport leg. That could be expensive and somewhat extremely expensive. If you are having goods, I give you a practical example at uh, Sakhalin. That's a big island north of Japan. And you have quite a few Norwegian companies in the offshore uh, equipment business that have deliveries to that part of the world. And then this last transport leg, let's say from Busan, this, this big port in uh, South Korea, and to the column might be very expensive. And this also is important with the logic of, of um, um, well incoterms, because you, you often have this division because it's uh, early transport, the main transport, and last transport leg. And um, Again, these obligations are they related to cost and also related to risk. And if they're related to risk, you also your promise where, when uh, is that sellers and buyers' obligations. And it's all kind, this is a mirror, folks. I mean, uh, it's if it's not the seller's obligation, it's the buyer's obligations. And basically speaking, you go all the way. Let's have a look at the brochure. You can see this um, being repeated here. Uh, risico in English meaning risk, cost in other meaning costs, and documents actually, uh, documentary in Norwegian that is related to the border formalities. And uh, as we have uh, uh, dealt with during the first uh, hour, that is uh, important to take into account when international transport. So whose obligations are that really? And you have you go from the minimum minimum obligation of the seller, uh, being those um, terms close to the sellers, 
and on the other hand side well then you mirror it if I'm a buyer then I have the maximum risk I had to take in count all the transport all the way from China to Norway all the way from Brazil to Norway whatever but on the other hand if I'm the seller if I'm a Brazilian seller and say okay I get the goods here to Molde if they are delayed they are destroyed if none cannot pa pass the border it's my obligation I haven't fulfilled my obligations and these are the uh, sort of the basic questions that uh, Incoterms address and as I mentioned to you there are also this border issue the formalities you have to fill that export declaration who is in charge of that uh, and also the import um, declarations that you had to take into account and of course also the time you need uh, that could be a quite a challenge are they foreseeable or how you just to calculate with three days five days in order to 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 be able to to do that does the freight forward have a network or do you just they both to have a network that could be uh, important to have some references in, in that sense you can also though, use, if you're inside Cameroon, if you're inside China, if you're inside Norway or whatever, Brazil, you can also use these uh, rules inside the countries, but of course then this border passing as such is normally it's not an issue. <coughs> um, okay, so these are the main questions that are addressed. You also have this security issue coming up uh, that you have to prevail with the security risk. I just give you one practical example. If you, if your obligation on the FRB to have the goods on board the ship, but uh, if you uh, have a hauliers company association that, uh, well, the truck driver doesn't have the, the permit to get into Molde Harbor, Oslo Harbor, or whatever, and you have your promise as a seller to, to deliver then um, as this first driver is not allowed the he has to go back to the truck to find another truck driver who has this uh, license well then he came back but it turned out to be too late the ship has already left the harbor and uh, you just stand there with the goods you haven't delivered the goods so according to the contract you haven't fulfilled your obligations so this is uh, an example of how these security rules may come into play and uh, you say that if you're delivering an FOB, okay, I said that, that, that I will be able to fulfill that promise. And I um, also have to stress that packaging, uh, in whatever ink terms you use, it's the obligation of the seller to make sure that the packaging is uh, proper done and uh, of course that has to do with the means of transportation and uh, how far you should transport the goods or it should be transferred far up in the Andes in Bolivia you might, uh, you might uh, figure that the roads are pretty bumpy and, uh, and you need uh, quite another w uh, packaging to take that into account for example Okay, these are the thinker terms. I think I'll rather show you this chart here. Um, and um, let's see. Hmm. Because I think we should spend the rest of the hours uh, dealing with this various thinker terms, and you may see in practice what this is all about okay yeah this in a brochure as well it's somebody somewhat different here uh, but as I mentioned you go from the minimum obligation of the seller to the and being on the other side mirroring the maximum obligation of the buyer to the maximum obligation of the, 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 the seller and buyer and now with the modern inco terms um, inco terms uh, are rules um, uh, made by the ICC, International Chamber of Commerce, in uh, Paris. I've been active with the revising of the 2000s rules as well as the 2010 rules. 
And it's a very interesting process, really, meeting people from all over the world, discussing these terms and how they apply, how they're used and misused, etc. Okay, you have this physical transport, as I said. You, you can imagine, well, and uh, if it's the seller's and the bar's place, you can take as a point of departure a, a simple uh, situation where the seller is actually the, the, the place where the goods are produced, the buyer is actually the where place where the goods are, uh, the, the consignee where they um, get the goods and also perhaps use the goods, or if they sell it, then, then you sort of say change hats from uh, the buyer now. Uh, is seller. That, that you should also be aware of that. Uh, you should ask where in the transport uh, or where in the logistics chain are you? I mean if you're dealing with supply chain, if you have a consignment to, to China then I, I'm here in Molde and but I really want to sell most of my goods in Sweden. Uh, when buying goods from China I'm a buyer but at the next place I'm the seller. So I change hat and uh, also position according to income terms. Anyhow, we have this red uh, line here uh, relating to the transport risk, but also relating to um, when, to the time promise, and where, what conditions the goods are in. You have the, um, the blue line related to the transport cost, who had to pay the transport to <coughs> Schenke, Bring, um, Lufthansa, or whatever company who take uh, DHL and so forth, will ever organize the transport as such. And also the export and import formalities. It's a bit uh, tricky then to, to show this as continual lines here, because you really have before or after the, the customs uh, border. So uh, you should be aware of that. Also, the logic here is that uh, the, um, the thicker part of this line relates to the seller's obligations and the thin line relates to the, the buyer's obligations. You also see some dotted lines and then you have some freedom of choice. Um, the model in terms is that you have the so-called multimodal um, terms. And this multimodal terms meaning that you're you're sort of say much freer to mm, to use all means of transport. Whereas these traditional income terms are related to sea transport only. But we see much misuse of them. Just <coughs> just to give you a practical example, uh, Rødos is a town uh, in the interior of Norway. And you, you have the biggest river in Norway, um, the Gloma, they have their sources in the vicinity of Rødos, but you definitely cannot go by boat to Rødos. Uh, not in the real world. But if you write F or B Rødos, then you really act as though there was a port in Rødos, and if the goods were on board in Rødos. So, I mean, uh, that's a, just a nonsense use of Inco terms, because uh, it's only the business lawyer who can make a lot of money, but in these cases, what do you really mean? But the logic is like this, you have uh, first X works, as I say, that's the minimum obligation of the seller, you just have to make the goods ready, you have to do, have them marked and packaged and so forth, and so-called individualized, so that you know that those are exactly the goods that should be provided for, for the buyer. But they could just stand there, you can even stand in a warehouse, and uh, as the buyer, or actually you, you, as I mentioned to you, the transport company is always a prolonged arm of the seller or the buyer. And this is very important for the logical inco terms such such, because what you do at first is to, to, to settle out whose obligation is this? Is it the seller's or the buyer's obligations? Uh, what happened quite a lot in practice is that uh, you have something going wrong and this you have the seller and say, hey, it was, um, it was DHL or DSL. Can I, can I get my contact person in DHL? Hey, you messed it up, you man, you stupid idiot, and so forth. And uh, that could be perhaps for your uh, own blood pressure uh, release. But 
it's you're, you're sorting out things because you're getting things totally wrong because it might not be your obligation at all. So f first question, is it the seller's obligations or buyer's obligations? Um, the obligations are always related to Inca terms. Also, to, so the, um, the big stones in the river first, you have four group in Inca terms. You have the E group, the F group, the C group, and the D group. I, uh, some words on that before I go into the, the, the specific terms. E, e group is also just one, it's X works as you can see. Uh, um, here, um, that is the minimum regulations first. Then you have the F group. Uh, also for the C terms here, you can see that is actually the, the first cover normally the first transport leg. That might be the leg into a terminal, a typical FCA to a uh, airport, uh, truck terminal, railway terminal, and so forth, uh, or FOB like the um, the ship. But it still is the, the buyer who is in charge of the main transport as well as the last transport leg. So you start to get some more obligation for the seller, but you still is the, the buyer who has the main uh, obligations. Then you have the C terms. These turn out to be the most uh, difficult terms in Inco terms because as you can, s if you compare here, this answer you should be able to answer, if not, you will not pass the exam. Uh, sorry for being strict, but how about the, the blue line and uh, the, um, the red line with the C terms? Do they match? Yes or no? No, they don't match. As a matter of fact, this the, the the blue lines go much further than the the, the red lines, meaning let's say this um, <coughs> I, if you have this for example CPT I'm not pro quite sure but if you have Pre Petru Pavlovsk at Sakhalin. And then you write inco terms. It's 2010. Well, then you would think that if something goes wrong here, and if I was the, the, the consideration uh, buyer, I would say, hey, you, you have not fulfilled your obligations. But if goods are stuck in Busan, if they're stolen somewhere in Siberia, if they're delayed on the border control into Russia, whose obligation is that? Let's take, let's um, say that Schenker is doing the, all, the, the whole job, then in that sense, the prolonged arm of the seller. Okay? Then you should really know what this is about. Say okay then I pay the transport normal transport cost to to Schenker I, I do that as a seller, but the risk passes from the seller to the buyer when they're in the custody of the first transport company or if it's a door transport. So meaning, I as a seller take all the transport risk. The buyer as such has all the risks. So, what I can say as a seller then is that, okay, sorry about that uh, strike in uh, Busan, it's not my problem. Sorry about the goods being stolen in Siberia, it's not my problem. Sorry about this uh, delays in customs uh, into Russia, it's not my problem. It's your risk. I have delivered the goods here in Molde because it came a truck from Schenker and picked up the trucks here in Molde and they were in the custody where they were on board so to say to, to be, be right here in Molde so you my very dear buyer faces risk you have to if you don't have a transport insurance that cover this sorry well 
Now I don't know in terms I don't have a clue of risk. So I say I choose DDP Petroplask in Sakali. Okay. These are the so-called D group. These are the most extensive obligations of the seller, meaning also on the other hand side the minimum obligation of the buyer. So what happens now? I say hello. Uh, sorry about this strike in Busan. You have to sort it out. Would be the, the, the answer of the Russian uh, uh, buyer. So, well, this. Russian customs officers say uh, not easy to deal with. Okay. Not my problem. <laughs> that would be the proper answer of the Russian. I say, okay, well, I have a terrible news. These goods are lost somewhere in Siberia. I have don't have a clue where they are. Well, you just order for a new consignment. You see, there you take the risk on the whole distance even import clearance in Russia. Um, this is this last uh, point here is uh, specific with the DT terms. But then you may ask your question, was that a very wise option? Did you really take into account political risk and all that? Um, and also, as you write about in your thesis, uh, um, did you that Mr. Putin is angry with the uh, Norwegians being part of this uh, um, political uh, or trade restrictions uh, apply to Russia, so they do it vice versa. Um, so um, these are the D terms, the maximum obligation of the, of the, the, the seller. Okay, just to go through the various terms here. X works the minimum obligation of the seller. You can say, okay, I provided the goods. I didn't come to pick them up. It, uh, the you were too late. Uh, the the buyer, uh, the fire broke out in my warehouse. They didn't pick up the goods. Well, no problem. It's not quite as easy as that. But um, well, I'm a Chinese buyer. These goods are considered by the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs as strategic. We're most uh, we a bit to, to trade most goods with China, but this is uh, the, the the Norwegian uh, Foreign Office say, okay, you have to provide an export license. Well, who's going to provide to that? It's the Chinese customer over there. You can just imagine somebody from Hong Kong uh, or Shanghai knocking on the doors of Minister of Foreign Affairs. I would like to have an export license. Mm -hmm. Not based here. No, not Norwegian citizens. That won't be easy. Uh, we have. I can just tell you the other way around. You have on Revfos in Norway some exporters of military equipment. They get some very uh, important electronic equipment from USA. They wouldn't dare, for all that word, to say come to the US Export Authority and say, "Hey, we're in on Revfos in Norway. We'll fix export uh, permission." You're not Norwegians, you can't do that. So, uh, so they sell rather on the FCA terms, because on the FCA terms it's also important that when you are on sale on XORC terms, it's the buyer or the buyer's prolonged arm, meaning the transport company, you remember, who is in charge of loading the goods. But how come do they have the trucks? Do they have the people? Do they have the cranes to do the loading? Most uh, normally they don't have that. And um, if something, if, if the crates fall down, okay, if it's to a 10,000 crown as well, they don't care about that. But I've been to companies where you have just one crate, one pallet, the goods on that 10 million kroners. Well, then I can tell that people tend to get pretty formal. And they say, well, we did it, but it was you who had the risk. Sorry about that. So that's why many companies now choose to use the FCA term, free carry, meaning that I as a seller load the goods on board, I as a seller declare the goods for export, I as a seller provide all the uh, 
the export documents uh, or the licenses, uh, export licenses, if that might be a question. We do have two uh, various or uh, two two uh, kind of F FCA, uh, and uh, to give you one example, if you have this, um, you know, say if you this this goods go by uh, truck all the way down to um, Copenhagen, for example. Um, it might be convenient to say, okay, when they uh, then they load it at the truck, it will be the risk and the costs for the buyer for the rest of the transport leg. But supposing they were going uh, by plane to um, to Durban in South Africa and uh, the nearest plane or the air transport leg that would start at Gardermoen, so we'd have this first transport uh, going by truck to 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 guard the moon and then you could use this uh, FCA guard the moon rather than uh, than molde and also because then the goods could be consolidated and you as the seller or the buyer actually here would get a much uh, better transport price. Just to finish with the F terms, you have F S F E A free alongside ship. Then you are along the ship. If, uh, but the goods, the whole loading operation is for the buyer's risk and account. You have the F or B, the goods being on board. Um, now um, it has been a change, and it is also important for you write Inca terms as well as the version of Inca terms. Because if you just write F or B, then you have this stupidity of some data programs, so you adjust the brackets for writing F or B. You do have an American version of Inco terms. They are called not called Inco terms, but they're called revised American trade definitions. You should be very much aware of this if you if you have just F or B, nothing else. And this F or B is not just one; it's six, and it goes all the way. The American F or B might you mean X works, and they might mean DDP. And as I mentioned to you, this Russian example, your door to door somewhere in the far east in Russia and that is something very different so um, relating Inco terms and also relating to the version because and um, this all Inco terms really they originate in its age of sailing ships and you know before the containers, the loading and unloading operation were much more comprehensive. You had cranes that were hooked here, of course you still use that, but it's uh, not by far as um, convenient as it was in the old day. And you, you should pass the ship's rail, and then the crucial question is, if something happened, did they fall down inside the ship or outside the ship? If they fell down inside the ship, it was the buyer's problem if they fell off outside the ship. It was the seller's problem. Then you haven't delivered. So just to give you one example, in uh, in Helsinki, owing to the own rules, that uh, the, uh, the versions until 2010, it was the tractor that was and um, this wire in the crane. The it uh, broke down, so the tractor actually fell on the deck. It rolled all through the deck and splashed into the sea. Was this truck delivered according to the old rules? It was here and then the wire broke. Okay, here is the ship. Plus splash. Yes or no? Yes, it was delivered. It's because if it had happened here, outside the ship, it was not delivered. So, well, it's a real story actually, uh, but uh, now it has been changed and so now it should be on board, pre properly on board. So it's hanging here in the head, that does not suffice for the goods to be delivered. <coughs> but you still, yeah, sorry? Yes, very much so. 
because many comp uh, because this f of b c f r and c i f terms are not really uh, fit for using with containers door to door transport because as one of the gurus of Incoterm said you could go into a port take your camera and see what is really happening and you don't have this split here it's artificial it has nothing to do with reality and these um, companies who, who do these jobs get the goods or good they all they are also part of that job to to fasten the goods uh, so that's a, that's an integral operation so um, and also you have with x works you have many saying that i as a buyer take the whole account or a uh, tight whole uh, obligation but it's also artificial because uh, as I uh, underlined to you, most sellers they load the goods on board. Most sellers take the export declarations, and it's it's very difficult for someone, but being in Turkey or Japan or whatever countries, to do this ex to do this in Norway and vice versa. And also with this DDP, you really have to be you should be rep have a representation in this country, because if you don't have this representation, you might end up paying the VAT for the import and not getting it refunded. Yes? Uh, is it normally the seller or the buyer who has the most leverage in when it comes to negotiating? Well, that depends very much. Um, uh, just to take the from a strategic angle, you may say that uh, well, I mean, if you have the marketing, you have price, uh, product, place, and uh, promotion. I mean, yes, you co co you're uh, you're competing on these four P's, and of course, now we're speaking about place. You may either have the philosophy that I'm extremely good at producing these goods, but on the other hand, I'm a small company. I know that my transport companies, my transport, the, the transport prices I can acquire cannot match those all the my big, uh, those m the buying and selling to me. I don't know. I, I and consequently, I, for example, I would uh, buy on the DG term, making the seller to me having the maximum obligation. I would sell on X term for FCA term. I would have as little as possible to do with uh, transportation. On the other hand side, I could say that place being uh, competing on delivery is extremely important for me because uh, and this I would flag very high. Okay, I might not have the best products, I might not have the cheapest products, but my delivery service is so wonderful. You would just buy from me. Then I would uh, be most natural to buy on FCA terms even if the goods come from uh, overseas and I would buy mostly, well, I suppose you would buy an FCA press uh, from FOB, also from the Far East and I would sell on D terms uh, for example um, I don't know if they changed their strategy but Hog is a company making uh, chairs for um, office chairs and they were very good at that uh, they are very f famous for their design so they 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 competing on product, but they also can they have an excellent delivery service, and they even, for example, inside Germany they have beaten Germans uh, competitors, saying, "Okay, you you're good, but we're even better, especially when it comes to delivery service." So this is uh, the strategic way. Or, or but what what also would like to say to you is that you should be aware that you have this various transport leg and I, I used it was by no accident that I used this Russian example so that in some cases in some countries it can be extremely risky extremely expensive to take this door-to-door -door consignments <coughs> is you should also be aware of the fact when you I mean in the old days they used CC terms just to, to, to take a story that okay I have a customer in uh, Brazil, I have a sailing ship, uh, the customer he very much want me to take care of the main transport. Um, okay, I know with sailing ships I could be a lot of accident, uh, uh, stormy weather, 
I don't know if the goods uh, can ever reach uh, Sao Paulo, but I, I noticed that the bar is still insistent on me, me um, arranging for and paying for the man, main transport. And then in the old days I could say, okay, I go for CIF then, meaning that I would provide the transport to Sao Paulo, whereas the uh, Brazilian buyer would take the inland transport in Brazil. I would uh, insure the goods so that you as a buyer could draw on that insurance premium and then would de deliver the goods. But if the goods sunk, were stolen, something happened, it would be the, the buyer's risk. But you as a buyer could draw on that insurance. What is important then is just to, 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 to repeat is to, to make sure that the insurance covered these things. Because if you have this C, insurance, minimum insurance, then um, if the boat didn't sink, the, the insurance didn't c cover these events. So this is actually the logic then you have going from the maximum obligation we have, uh, and the C terms being this, uh, mm, what do you call it, two point, two critical points. And uh, if, you, if you come out of this, uh, after this uh, lecture, knowing that uh, in C terms, the, the place of delivery and uh, the place of, um, of um, destination or the, um, the transport cost is different, you know, much more in terms than many people in business life. <laughs> because, I mean, if you, if you don't know that, and that was a real story with a uh, big Norwegian company selling goods to India, they sell on C terms, they sell sold on, I think it was CFR, and then you have the same as FOB, when the goods passes the ship's rail, it's uh, the buyer's uh, risk. But what happened? This Indish, uh, Indian buyer was very pushy and said, hey, uh, it was stormy weather in the Indian Ocean, uh, you had to compensate for that. And then in another case, uh, somebody broke into a warehouse in the... Um, in, in um, oh, it was a big Mumbai, yes, and stole the goods. It's uh, and uh, he he ended up paying, and it was de delayed on inland transport in uh, India. But what he should have answered is that, well, sorry to hear about that, but I had delivered the goods when they, according to the CFR, passed the ship's rail. And when well now in the 2010 were still many are on board. So what happened later was actually your risk. Uh, and if you don't have an insurance that covers these uh, events, awfully sorry, but that's your problem. You can say that in real life, uh, if this is an important business contact, you try to, to sort out things, but uh, um, but really, th this is uh, anyhow il illustrating the price on not knowing what this is about because he paid so much to say in Norwegian uh, sellers and this turned out to be well, fairly unprofitable business because uh, you have not calculated for these events actually. Okay, any questions at the very end? Just short repetition, inco terms, seller and buyer according to the sale track contract or other way the, the, the buyer's contract, those are always apart. Everybody else is either the prolonged arm of the seller or the buyer. They deal with cost, meaning transport cost. You deal with uh, transport risk and also when it comes to international transport with border formalities, uh, who is to take that into account. You have 11 uh, various uh, terms going on the way from sellers, minimum obligations, meaning buyers, uh, maximum obligation, and vice versa, sellers, maximum obligation, meaning buyers, minimum obligations. So, um, and uh, this, uh, if you're ever going to deal with transport in real life, you will have to deal with this. Any questions? Okay. Thank you so much and all the best for the exam. <laughs> mm.